I'm Kevin. Welcome to my cave. Over the last few episodes, we've been off on a side project, designing, building, and trying out a test rig that applies a variable voltage to a transistor or diode and measures the current coming out of it. Now it's time to put that test rig to use. Let's take a step back and review how we got here. We'd built an amplifier like this one. We'd put in a capacitor that bypassed all the emitter resistance to see what would happen if we tried to extract the maximum possible voltage gain. When we tried it out, instead of getting extreme gain, we got a weird trace on the oscilloscope. Near the positive peaks of the input signal, the inverting amplifier clipped the output. That's not too surprising. We were simply asking for a bigger voltage swing than the circuit could deliver. The emitter resistor can only pull it down so far. But at the negative peaks of the input signal, that is, the positive peaks of the output, things get strange. The peaks get distorted into this gothic arch shape. We set off on the side project so that we can understand what's happening. We've built a test rig that takes our device, a transistor or diode, and applies a voltage ramp to one of its terminals. We built a circuit that can sense the current at another terminal. That circuit triggers the ramp generator to reset at a target current. We developed some software that lets us program our oscilloscope to record the input voltage and output current over a wide range, from nanoamps to milliamps. It records multiple traces for each of multiple current ranges, so as to average out noise and jitter. Let's start with the simplest semiconductor, a 1N4148 diode. Up to now, we've had a trivial model of its behavior. At forward voltages less than about 6 or 7 tenths of a volt, the diode is turned off and passes no current. And at that forward voltage, the diode takes on whatever resistance is necessary to hold the voltage at that level. The current through it goes up and up. How high? If something else doesn't limit the current, until the circuit goes up in smoke. But we know that real life is more complicated. We'll put a diode on our test rig and measure it. We'll replay the run from the scope and plot the points. It takes several minutes to collect all the data, so this is sped up significantly. Our trivial model wasn't actually all that bad. Down here, you have to squint to see that all the points don't lie on the axis. And for a useful range of current, the forward voltage drop is within 5% or so of being constant. But we now have the information to come up with a better model. The hockey stick shape of the data suggests exponential growth. Let's replot our observations on a log scale and see if that guess is right. Let the scope and computer do their thing. And the graph is really close to being a straight line. It appears we were right. Current through a diode goes up exponentially with the forward voltage. Let's run a few more types of device and see how well the rule holds. How about a bigger diode, a 1N4002? Looks pretty exponential to me. Let's branch out into some more diode-like things. We'll try the base emitter junction of a 2N4401 transistor with the collector lead disconnected. That's still pretty close to the diode behavior we might expect. How about the gate to channel junction of a J112 JFET? We'll tie the source and drain together and measure the current from the gate. The JFET junction also looks like a diode. What the heck? Let's put a red LED in there. The voltage scale comes out very different because the gallium arsenide of the LED has a wider band gap than the silicon of the devices we've seen so far. But it's still a diode. But the law does break down for some devices, such as Schottky diodes. It holds only for devices with a PN junction. Hot carrier diodes usually have a metal semiconductor junction, and those behave differently. 
In fact, if you look at the current voltage curves in the BAT41 data sheet, what we observe is not too different from the picture. Nice to know. The behavior of PN junction diodes that we've just seen is described by the Shockley diode equation, named for William Shockley, one of the inventors of the transistor. Its form is nearly an exponential. In the equation, I sub D and V sub D are the current through the diode and the voltage across it. I sub S is a quantity called the saturation current. You will never find it in a device data sheet because it's so highly variable. In particular, it's horribly temperature dependent. It roughly doubles with every 10 degrees Celsius of temperature increase. We'll see later on how we can arrange things so that we don't need to know its value. Saturation current is a confusing term. It refers to the saturation level of the current that flows when the diode is reverse biased. It would be less confusing if the physicists called it the leakage current, but we're kind of stuck with the term. It depends on the device and ranges from a femtoampere or so for a tiny junction, like the gate of a JFET, to maybe a microampere for a big power diode. Old school germanium diodes could have leakage currents of a milliampere or so. The typical femtoamp to microamp saturation current is so very tiny that we can virtually always ignore the negative one in the equation. V sub t is what's called the thermal voltage. Fortunately for us, V sub t is determined by fundamental physical laws. It's equal to Boltzmann's constant times the absolute temperature divided by the charge of the electron. That is, the absolute temperature times about 86 microvolts per Kelvin about 25 millivolts at room temperature. Finally, eta is a unitless constant called the ideality factor. It's generally between 1 and 2. It's nearly constant for a given type of device. It has to do with a semiconductor physics process called carrier recombination, which is another one of the aspects of solid-state physics where I've forgotten the details. Let's take a look at our actual diodes and see if this equation makes sense. We'll start with our basic example, the 1N4148 diode. We fit a straight line to the data, and we find a saturation current of a few nanoamperes and an ideality factor of about 1.88. Looks reasonable. And we can quickly fly through the other devices we tested. 1N4002, gate-to-source junction of a J112 JFET, and the base emitter junction of a 2N4401 BJT with the collector lead disconnected. They all have ideality factors between 1 and 2, as we said before. The saturation currents vary wildly, as you can see but they all yield about the right voltage drop for useful currents. One reason that I included the JFET and the LED is that they have phenomenally low reverse saturation currents. That tends to imply that their forward currents will be correspondingly low when there's only a low or negative voltage across them. While you can get precision low leakage diodes like the 1N3595, a lot of designers will just use a JFET, an LED, or a diode-connected BJT, which we'll look at very soon as a low-leakage diode. In fact, I didn't have a 1N3595 on hand for comparison. So now we have a much more faithful model of what a diode is really doing. Of course, since one view of a transistor is just that it's two diodes connected together, this model will be helpful in explaining transistors as well. I'll take that up in the next episode, rather than making this one a marathon explanation. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll stay tuned for that. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye!